Welcome. In this lecture, we're going to expand our idea of the conservation of energy to look at conservation of total energy. And mainly in this class, for our purposes, we're just going to look at how we deal with friction. So we've already talked about the fact that the total energy of a system, the change of that total energy is equal to zero. All right. The total energy of a system is conserved. And up to this point, we've only talked about mechanical energy. But we want to include all forms of energy. So really what this means is we've got the change in mechanical energy, which we've already talked about, plus the change in something called thermal energy. We know that when we rub our hands together really fast, the friction between them causes heat. And that's really what friction does. It converts mechanical energy into thermal energy. And we can also talk about the change in chemical energy. Many of you in AP Chem last year looked at changes in chemical energy. And let's just put a catch-all here, the change in all other forms of energy. Because even mass itself at rest has an energy because of Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. So for our purposes in this class, we're really only concerned about these two. All right, we're going to table these guys for right now and say that we're not dealing with chemical energy in chemical reactions, and we're not dealing with nuclear reactions where mass is being converted directly into energy. And so let's take a look at this idea of thermal energy. Thermal energy, as I already said, was related to friction. All right, so let's define thermal energy equal to the opposite of the work done by all frictional forces. Okay, It's opposite because friction takes energy out of a system. So the work done by friction is negative. It slows things down. And so we're going to say that it's the opposite of the work done by friction. That's equal to the thermal energy. So we can now say that our change in the energy of the system is going to equal 0, which is going to equal the change in the mechanical energy minus the work done by frictional forces. And again, the work done by frictional forces itself is going to be negative, negative, which is going to turn that guy right there into a positive sign. Okay, So we're going to sum all of those up. So the energy of a system at any one time is equal to the energy of that system at any other time minus the work done by frictional forces between points 1 and 2. Let's take a look at an example of this in action. So here's our example. We have a mass in an inclined plane. And we can solve this problem with Newtonian mechanics, uh, F equals ma, but we're going to solve it with conservation of energy instead. Now, there is a force of friction here, and there's some coefficient of kinetic friction equal to something. That's what we're trying to find. What is the coefficient of kinetic friction? Here's what we know. We've got a box of mass m at the top of the ramp. The vertical distance from the top of the ramp to the bottom of the ramp is 5 meters. And at some time later, the box slides down the ramp with some velocity here. We'll call it v2 equal to 4.0 meters per second. Now, if we did this problem without friction, we would find that the velocity of the box at the bottom of the ramp should be closer to like 9.9 .9 meters per second. So the box is losing mechanical energy. It does not have the same amount of kinetic energy at the bottom as the gravitational potential at the top. And the reason mechanical energy is going away is it's getting converted into thermal energy through friction. OK, so let's call the top of the ramp where the box starts at rest our point 0.1. And let's call the bottom of the ramp our point 2. And let's add a third part to this problem and say that the box slides across the floor with the same coefficient of friction as on the ramp. We want to find out how far does the box slide before coming to rest. So two problems here. We're going to find the coefficient of kinetic friction, and we're also going to find the displacement of the box along the flat part of the floor before it comes to rest. So let's go ahead and call that stopping point on the horizontal floor, point 3. Now here's what conservation of energy is going to tell us. That the energy at point 1 is going to equal the mechanical energy at point 2 minus the work done by friction in getting from 1 to 2. And that is going to equal 
the mechanical energy of the box at point three, which is zero, because here's our zero point of gravitational potential, the floor, and it comes to rest, so there's no kinetic energy, it's not attached to a spring, so there's no spring potential energy. So this is just gonna equal the opposite of the work done by friction in going all the way from point one to point three. All right, so there is our starting point. And the mechanical energy at point one, it just has gravitational potential, so it starts from rest. So let's take a look first to solve for the coefficient with this first part of our conservation of total energy. So what kind of energy does it have at one? It's got gravitational potential, mgy1. And that is going to equal the mechanical energy at point two. It just has kinetic energy at point two. And we're going to subtract off the work done by friction. And the work done by friction here is the force of friction dotted with the displacement. And we'll just call that L, the length down the ramp, the length of the ramp. So breaking this down a little bit further, we've got mgy1 is equal to 1 half mv2 squared minus the magnitude of the force of friction, which is coefficient times the normal force, dotted with the length. And we're going to do the cosine of the angle between the friction vector and the length vector. And that's 180 degrees. There's where our negative sign comes in. So we need to find our normal force. So drawing a free body diagram, we've got mg going down. And we've got mg in the, oh, let's go ahead and call it the perpendicular direction. And that's equal to the normal force. This is theta. So the normal force is going to be mg cos theta. So let's plug that stuff in. We have mg y1 is equal to 1 half mv2 squared minus mu mg cos theta. And L, let's see here. We can find L in terms of theta because we know that the sine of our angle, 20 degrees, is equal to opposite, which is 5, over adjacent, which is L. And let's go ahead and put it more generally. Let's just say y1 over L. So we have L is equal to y1 over the sine of theta. So let's plug that in for L down here. y1 divided by the sine of theta. And let's take care of that cosine 180 degrees. That's a negative, so that's going to make a positive here. All right. So now we can do some simplification. We see that we have an m in every term on both sides of the equation, so those cancel out. We remind ourselves that we're solving for the coefficient of friction, and we have cosine theta over sine theta. That's going to equal the cotangent of theta. So let's solve for mu now. So we've got g y1 minus 1 half v2 squared is equal to mu g cotangent theta times y1. Solving for mu, we're going to divide by cotangent theta, g and y1. Making this a little bit prettier, 1 over the cotangent is really the tangent. So we've got the tangent of theta times g y1 minus 1 half v2 squared all divided by g y1. That's equal to mu. Let's just go ahead and be specific here. Whoops, didn't want to cross out the mu. The mu. All right. So now we can plug that into our handy dandy calculator and see what we end up with. And when I throw everything in, I get a coefficient of static friction equal to 0 0.30. It's really, really nice, so I want to pretend or believe that I did that correctly in my calculator. So we've solved the first part of our problem. The coefficient of friction is 0 0.3. Next part of our problem is solving for delta x. And we can use this part of the problem here now to solve for our delta x. Because, actually, what we really need 
And if we think about this problem here, if we look at the mechanical energy it has at point two and the work mechanical energy it has at point three, what we can say here is that the mechanical energy at point two is going to equal just the opposite of the work done by friction from two to three. That way we can avoid having to deal with the work done by friction over that whole distance. Because we only have kinetic energy at point two. That's this guy right here. And that means that we only need to account for the friction from point two all the way to point three. And that's going to allow us to find delta x. So let's move this on to the next page. We know that the kinetic energy at point two is going to equal the opposite of the work done by friction from point two to point three. Kinetic energy at two is one half mv2 squared. And this is equal to the opposite of the force of friction dot delta x. So putting some information in here, we have 1 half mv2 squared is equal to the opposite of the magnitude of the frictional force, which is coefficient times the normal force. And my pen just went crazy. Times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors, which again is cosine 180. Breaking that down even further, we have 1 half mv2 squared is equal to mu mg delta x and our cosine of 180, the negative sign here, makes a positive sign here. So we leave it as positive. Now we are solving for delta x, so let's go ahead and do that. We notice that there's a mass on both sides that cancels out, so goodbye mass. And we are going to have v2 squared all over 2 mu g. That's equal to delta x. So let's throw that into the calculator and see what we end up with here. Just plugging in some numbers here, we have v2 squared is 16. We're going to divide that by 2 times 0 0.3 times 9.8. And the calculator is going to give us an answer of 2.72 meters. So there's our answer for how far the box slides along the horizontal floor before it comes to rest. And we could verify all of that with Newton's laws and do the problem with kinematics, find the acceleration of the box down the ramp, and find out its speed at the bottom of the ramp. Oh, no, sorry, we already know the speed at the bottom of the ramp. Uh, find the force of friction down the ramp using Newton's laws, and then find the displacement once we know the acceleration across the horizontal floor using Newton's second law. So this is really just another way to do the problem, another tool in our toolbox. And if this way is easy for you, go for it. If this problem shows up on the AP test, use whichever way you think is best. Okay, But here's an example of how we take into account the mechanical energy converted into thermal energy as a result of friction. All right, so.